Thank you. Uh, I, I think this works actually pretty nicely. Uh, I mean, first of all, the problem of formalizing in history. I, I, when I say historical view, it means that I'm talking all the time about conceptual change in, in studied history and, and not how conceptual formation has changed in history. Uh, and the problem that we have in history is that uh, we really can't ask that people uh, what they or, or nicely to put things in, in a particular way. And the real problem is, is time as well. Uh, and, and, and how we model time, and especially when uh, the point in the, in the view that I will present is that this kind of a, was an old fashioned way to think that if we have political concepts, we have Aristotle talking to Hobbes, talking to Wittgenstein, talking to us, which always leads to an anachronism. Uh, because they they formally when they formulating when they're talking about something they're usually talking about a different thing and, and, and that is really the the way where uh, I'm approaching this question and but this is very very important now uh, for example in sociolinguistics when it's, the idea is to model knowledge uh, and meaning as as the course is. So I will, what I will be doing is I'm presenting you a case. I have no real good answers. I think we have to move uh, to the direction where we can actually have more formal ways of doing it. But, but the truth is that in history, the way that history and intellectual history, political history, which is my background and what I will be talking about, uh, there had, hasn't really been any, any uh, good ways how to use artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning in a way that, that we really would benefit the core of the subject field. So that, to open this problem is my idea, and, and I'm not going to be able to, to give you a formalized answer how it needs to be done, but maybe, maybe to talk about some avenues of where to go. So, Timo already mentioned in the beginning, we organized a conference. If you're interested about this question in history, Actually, we have all of the videotapes of all of the presentations that were given, uh, but it's, it just happened that we have a continuous 14-hour uh, uh, video uh, which needs to be edited. But, but that will happen when we have some time to do it. Uh, but, but anyway, in, in early December we had different perspectives, some from history, some from linguistics, philosophers, Joni uh, Matikukka, as mentioned already, and other, other views. Uh, so if, you, if you're interested in that, I, I, I suggest that uh, look into this. What my talk can be sort of an introduction to everything that was open right now. Now, I was in a hackathon during the weekend, and uh, there was a, one group was using similarities, uh, was the idea is image similarities using artificial intelligence. So no use of metadata, anything, just deep learning, uh, how to I mean, they used some teaching material, large, large amounts of it, and then how to recognize similar concepts. So here you have, this is the problem that they came up with, cow and horse are classified as one. Uh, but if you, if you think about, I mean, now again, the, if I have a concept of justice in history, and again, the, the way that our view of justice, uh, we have a very strong sense, this is a sort of a classic problem that we have in in intellectual history. Distributive justice is a core idea in, a, in the way that we talk about justice. Then in ancient formulation there are some aspects where distributive justice means a completely different thing than does these things. And then you have medieval authors who are, as, for example, explaining uh, that necessity knows no law. And some people are interpreting that this is a way of saying that there is a medieval idea of justice the idea of what we have is there already. But then there's a question, I mean, how can you have distributive justice before you have a modern state? And a lot of books have been written about this subject. So meaning that the justice in, in terms of, of cows and horses is really really like that. And the justice doesn't work in, in the function of a, as an animal might, might, might hear. And, and then what we can do with different ways of modeling uh, and to keep, retain these ideas, because there hasn't been, I mean, the, the, it's still an ongoing dispute whether we can talk about distributed justice before end of the century or not. So one way uh, that now, I mean, I'm just 
throwing it out there is that uh, we had Peter de Bola and, and, and Siskin, uh, they were talking about their way of how to formalize uh, conceptual change in history. And, and there the idea is that instead of talking about semantics, uh, really, I mean, they want, what they want to do is we, we think about historical concept as kind of epistemic architectures instead of linguistic uh, objects. So, so that is one way of where you can move away, uh, perhaps. I mean, I mean, then the question of our practice, how it's actually done, whether it's just uh, looking at, at, at particular words and, and other related words or, or, or something new, that, that's another question. Well, but how, how that function is, is, is one question. But, but that's one of the new ways where, uh, in historical concepts, some kind of new thinking has come about. To move away a little bit from the semantics and try to somehow map epistemic architectures and track there. Meaning that, that then you can find uh, concepts that are the, what Peter de Bola calls load bearing concepts and carry other concepts and, 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 and then to make the kind of architecture. Not fully convinced that, it, that, that we still have heard the last word of that, but, but that's one way of going. Well, this is the dream that all of us who work with, uh, I guess, digital humanities or, or, or large text. Uh, bases, uh, databases, uh, our dream is that uh, we get rid of the idea that one interpreter puts the idea of my formulation of justice based on my reading of this and that, and instead uh, the algorithm does the work and, and something new comes about from the whole of 18th century texts and, and, and then we have a formulation of justice and where we can go about looking at, look at, look at it in new ways. And this is, this is one, uh, I guess, that everybody has this dream. Uh, it is a very unrealistic dream in many sense. Uh, there's so many problems relating to the databases. First of all, access, usually, usually uh, the institutions that hold these materials will not give them to you as one data type, so you can do, uh, you use your algorithms on the 18th century collection from them. Example, but there's there's change going on there, so we, we, we will have to see see what comes about. I mean, in the idea that that we would have enough uh, data to, to make some kind of constructions where, where these kind of net networks uh, conceptually can can be made. I mean, whether you can reconstruct something like that, or whether you're just putting your own ideas into that, that's another question. But then in history, uh, what happens? You're always dealing with this kind of concepts. You're dealing with enlightenment. Uh, and the problem in Enlightenment is that uh, nobody in the 18th century who were actually, for example, part of Scottish Enlightenment used the term Enlightenment. Kant uses it once, but it's coined in the 19th century. Yet there's, there's, there's clear uh, ways in, in, in that we recognize why some thinkers are Enlightenment thinkers. One, here's one uh, definition. Uh, enlightenment can be characterized as an intellectual movement based upon the pursuit of rational principles optimism about the potential intellectual inquiry and scientific investigation to reveal the secrets of creation and the corresponding desire to break with restricting faith-based systems of explanation. Now that is a very questionable way of using it. I mean, of course the idea is that, as, as we heard before, that, that we don't want to have dictionary concepts only, but, but move, move away from that. But if you look at, if you're an Enlightenment scholar, you know that uh, Books and books have been written about what is French Enlightenment. This kind of a, has been contested greatly. Scottish Enlightenment is, I mean, all of these form their own, own form, forms of literature. And, and the point is that if you don't, if you're not engaged in that, and if you're trying to come from outside, making a different sort of a sort of grasping a concept without actually being part of the uh, ongoing scholarly debate, it might become very, very difficult and tedious actually to say, contribute anything to, to this. But I mean, that this is also one hope that we have, that the use of big data and history and looking at it from different aspects gives us a new ways of uh, making uh, periodizations and, and, and so forth. So that, that is very important, important activity, but how to deal with this kind of a I mean, I mean, there's so much, so many things moving uh, that, that the formalization in practice becomes very, very difficult. 
And now, and if and the anachronism, if we're talking about historical studies, I mean, this is the whole of training in, in history. They say that we don't have any methods. Well, I mean, the method is to source criticism. That 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 is what you're trained at doing, and that's why you are, most people are very professional historians are very uh, suspicious about the use, and that's one reason why not really anything has been attempted seriously by by sort of a more higher up uh, historians and so forth. And the main under says, one doesn't Google historical context, you can understand how that, that expands. Then, I mean, if I just say about the war is, I mean, that, that obviously, I mean, nowadays people understand Adam Smith as a, his Wealth of Nations, is the idea is that most important part of it is the idea of an invisible hand. And, and if you interpret it through that context, and, and this is something that historians know, uh, is that you don't really grasp any of its meaning. So, so if you're connecting uh, today's market economy to Adam Smith's use of uh, uh, invisible hand, you, you, you go wrong, because he, he wasn't what we think he was. And, and, and this, the, the avoidance of this that we have, that the concept has evolved to some, some direction, and us uh, Finding it in the historical texts is, is that's the greatest worry that historians have. Whether that's right or wrong, uh, that's another question. And then you have, I mean, just as another example, I mean, historians are very intrigued by this kind of ideas that originally the beehive was understood in a wrong way, so that they thought that the, the, that the king was the most important one there in, in ancient times. And then you have a literary text that is translated from antiquity, and, and whether you call it in the translation, the king, the queen, or the queen, queen the king has has consequences. But it just just gives you the idea. I mean, what are, I mean, this kind of thing for historians is a big deal, and whether you could actually talk about the high and how it's been represented throughout the times based on some uh, algorithm or, or I mean, modeling. That's a different question. And, and then you end up uh, then the historians from there will go to the idea that okay, yes, chess was played in the earlier times. Uh, in early modern period, in chess, the, the king was the, actually the one that moved free instead of the queen. So, so, so this, this kind of thing will overtake the historian, and, and any kind of form of conceptualization is forgotten because it, it, it's always the particular that's important. But I guess the argument is that you need both. You need the quantitative way of finding the relevant uh, pieces of the narrative as well. And just as a model, I mean, well, uh, the difference between sociolinguistics that comes pretty close to, to histo historical studies but, but, and, uh, and, and historians, historians would be very uh, unimpressed by the idea that uh, okay, here you have all of the early modern plays and Shakespeare's plays when, when it's the use of language uh, it's not so rare uh, uh, although I mean, the way, way the language is used in Shakespeare is basically pretty traditional, it's, it's not outlandish in any way. So, so a social linguistic might find this kind of modeling as important and good, but historians would be immediately questioning I mean, well, what is the real value of that and so forth. And, and, and how do you define the abuse of language in, in, in this sense? So, I mean, the, the idea, I mean, that if, you, if we are approaching this, I think we should be approaching from the perspective of a, a idea that we can model concepts is, but first we have to remember that uh, when intellectual and conceptual historians study, they are really interested about the authorial intention. So for example, Hobbes' Leviathan, uh, it's not the, I mean, the propositions and arguments, let alone that you can only read the Leviathan and understand what's going on, but you, you always have to understand what is what is he, Hobbes is doing when he presents some proposition and argument. So, so it's not the acts that we can talk about without the use of the acts. And that, that is really the idea. And, and this is the Skinnerian uh, idea that has dominated uh, intellectual history for a very long, whether that's right or not, uh, that's hard to say. Just, I mean, the, just to briefly, I mean, if you, you're interested about reading, I mean, how have we come about in the conceptual change in history to read this. So maybe this list of people might be something that you could start with. The hermeneutic way of, of 
parallel and dialogue between past, present and future. Uh, then there are other people who in the 1920s, 30s were actually formulating these ideas of we could have universal units of ideas, great chain of being, Arthur <coughs> Lovejoy and others. It was a Leckian way of looking at uh, conceptual history is very interesting, actually could be developed into, into a model where the idea is that it's not the necessary, well, coherence in some sense, but it's more of the struggle over the definition of key concepts at different periods of time that is, is the, what, what we need to be looking at, and, and through that uh, grasping the meaning. Then you have uh, John Pocock uh, in the 80s, 90s, it was very traditional to say that, okay, these are political languages that we study. So, so it's, you can't grasp the, the, the concepts without actually understanding the language. So, so that you first learn the language of whatever that might mean in political argumentation. And, and, and then only you, you understand what's going on in the 17th century. Skinner, um, well that was the Hobbes, Hobbes idea, that everything comes through a historical context. And that there the context is really understood differently than uh, sociolinguistics, for example, where context can be use a word and, and a related uh, text around that, but the political argument is really that is Hobbes uh, defending the king or, or, or what is he doing when he's crafting the riot. And well, well, I left the Peter de Bola and those out who want to move away from meaning a little bit more towards studying structure, but the idea of digital knowledge Dimo was also maybe talking in our conference a little bit uh, about this way, but, but the idea there is that uh, maybe if we think about digital knowledge and we use these large data banks, maybe there's something else that we are doing and we can move away from the analog idea that now we only have to grasp the idea that is exactly there, uh, and, and move towards understanding the, the subject matter, but, but then grasping something uh, more related to the world as such as well. Okay, well, <clears throat> and, and, and just as, as an example, we have, uh, we got funding from the Finnish Academy. We're starting a, a study of transformation of public discourse in Finland. There's many different partners in this. Uh, and here the public discourse, how it's understood, how we should understand it as a concept, and, uh, and then how uh, contemporary people were discussing about it and what happened to it. Uh, all of those sites are what we are trying to study here. And we are implementing two different approaches. One is the sort of a metadata approach uh, where material basis of change are understood. And then we also do kind of idea of using text mining to, to look at the Finnish newspapers that have been digitized from 1770 to 1910. So here the idea is a little bit of, uh, again, about conceptual change, is the sort of an intermediate solution. So we study first the movement of the vehicle, which here is either books or, or newspapers or, or letters, because we can't really talk to the people of the past, they're not there. You know? so, so we have to look at the aspect uh, of the, whatever the, material that we have, and, and then the idea of the concept that are carried within them comes afterwards. So, so really the sort of network of publishers, what is happening, becomes almost as important in the study of concepts as then the looking at the text itself. And just as an example, here's a publication activity in Vasa from 1764 to 1917. And when we're looking at public discourse, this is quite a because we don't have really evidence of the people of, from Vasa, that many talking in the early 19th century what was happening. But when we're looking at the publication records, we notice that uh, it almost collapses the publications in Vasa. And that is the period of time when in Finland we changed from Swedish rule to Russian rule. And uh, in Vasa, they, they had a district court and the publication I mean, the, the idea of public discourse was that uh, all of the publication records from the court were published in the late Swedish times. But then you get to the early, early Russian times and this happens. And, 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 and 
I mean, it's not the way, this is one way of approaching the concepts of public discourse as such, and, and we can do many things based on, on, on sort of a material basis of, of, of proofs in history. And here we have to understand that, that we're really always just following, we're looking at the material objects, whether they are text or, or, or records of what was published. Because we really don't have access to people's minds as such. Another thing that we're doing is intellectual geography, uh, which is also a little bit maybe, maybe easier to, to do to look at uh, questions of identity related to public discourse, uh, looking how, uh, how just often, for example, Moscow is discussed in newspapers and Dortmund and so forth. Another, again, sort of an intermediate way of getting to the concept of Finnishness, for example. And this is just to remind, remind us that the practical problems are the ones that we would need to overcome first. We can have very nice theories what, what we might be able to do, but because the OCR problems, natural language processing, all of that, uh, it just just to use the, the newspapers that we have in Finland, it's very different when, when you think of what you can do uh, related to a network analysis using, using something like Facebook or Twitter and, and, and so forth. And, and, and the fact that we don't always have the, even the data available complicates things quite a bit. But, but, but it's, well... Okay, then two examples of ways that uh, others have done similar things in elsewhere. This is a, a, pro a project where they looked at reference cultures. Here the idea is that reference culture is a mental construct not necessarily a representation of a geopolitical reality and uh, they are established in public discourse over a long period of time. So here they look at religious ways of uh, sort of a mapped out that self-expression values are more used in Protestant Europe than in, in, in Islamic uh, cultures, reference cultures and, 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 and so forth. And the way that they do this, this is based on newspapers as well, uh, it's called asymmetric uh, development process. Is that uh, so? When they when they start all the work on it, they have historians who they discuss what are the concepts that they're looking for, and they have a, so they use machine learning partly so semi-automatic concept expansion, and then they contextualize that. Historians are all the time very much involved, and, and then they try to do a diachronic studies looking at different words based on this uh, in different languages. Whether they, this actually produces results is another question. I mean, you can always, you know, I mean, it's a start, you know, so to say. That's what they kind of think. I mean, obviously, early modern Europe was, was very intact in ways. So, so it's, it's a good idea, sort of a mental, mental side of this. And this uh, is just a, a, a picture. This is the, what I think in historical studies, the very best. Uh, so far that has been done regarding uh, conceptual change. It's by uh, Tim Hitchcock, Hitchcock's uh, group. Uh, they used, they have this Old Bailey Online, which is legal documents in, in, in London from, uh, I can't remember, well, early on, 1640s on, no, so, sorry, here, 1760s to 1910. Uh, and the idea here is to look at the language used in those documents regarding violent crimes. And, and this is to look at, this is a good way of uh, uh, proving or disproving a theory in history. So there's a, Norbert Elias, he has a famous uh, theory about civilization process, where the idea is that the monopoly of violence plays a great role uh, and the European Societies change considerably while, while the, the monopolization of violence happens during the 18th, 19th century, especially. So, what they were able to show is that violent crimes and non violent crimes were talked in a similar manner in, in the late, early 1770s. There wasn't that big of a difference in the use of language. But then, as time progresses, the, the description of the crimes it changes. So, so, the kind of a, one way of showing that the Elias is civilization process also shows in the records of the description of violent crimes. That, I think, uh, is maybe the 
best we have so far on, on, on conceptual change or, or showing what can be in historical studies. And this is just to show I mean, what kind of uh, I would be interested to know, uh, or I know that a lot of historians would be interested in this kind of question. So, what can we say about David Hume's conception of politics? And this von Hontian question is he an anti Machiavellian Machiavellian thinker, or is he a post Machiavellian Machiavellian thinker? And uh, so, in order to get to the question, we always we have to have read quite a bit of Hume and then also the political theory at the time. But it also can, I mean, the, the anti-Machiavellian part of the argument is pretty simple. And it's that uh, commerce doesn't play, it's, it's criticism towards the time uh, before, Hume's, before Hume, where they said that politics and commerce, economy, didn't go together as they should. That, that was the criticism. And, and this is one way that you could maybe use machine learning to look at uh, how politics was discussed, is this actually true? But then to get the point whether Hume is a Machiavellian thinker, that, that's a political question. It uh, would be difficult to answer that based on, on any arguments and so forth. But anyway, so, so that, that, there you can see, I mean, it's, the idea is that you need to combine maybe, maybe uh, different uh, elements and, and well, it, it, it's not, not that uh, we could replace the historians at any point in this work. So, just conclusions. Uh, modeling based on machine learning is very interesting, but the teaching, learning, discovering, I mean, that, that relationship, uh, it, I, guess, I, mean, I guess the main problem is that we just don't have enough cases. We haven't done of, 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 of work on this. Rethinking digital knowledge against traditional analog understanding since formalizing historical conceptual change it is not going to happen very neatly. And then also what is important if you want to work on this, you, it's good to take your starting point from something useful in the theory. There's so much theory written for example in, in political thought or study of history of political thought and the study of uh, what was the impact of a linguistic term in, in study of ideas and so forth. So, so to find some kind of a good starting point from there and carry on. So that, that would be very useful. And, and then also to accept that, that it's really a sort of a beginning of the journey and, and, and to take forward. But by doing collaborate, collaborative work, for example, between physics, people with background in physics, in history, and language technology and so forth. So, so that, that's the way, maybe the way that we can come up with something new. But it's the practi practical aspect first and then feel. That's the order we have. That's all. Thank you very much.